Good afternoon. Welcome back to the BNH virtual event space. We are here with award-winning wildlife photographer, and I'm going to try to not mess this up because, you know, I, I told him I was going to challenge myself to pronounce it the right way and not just take the easy way out. Yahon, Yahon, Yeah. All right. I, get, I think I, I, like a B minus maybe on the pronunciation. B. Let's but, give you a B. All right. There we go. A B. Solid B. Um, we have a wonderful presentation for you guys today. As you can see, you got some amazing wildlife images up on the screen, but I know he does have a packed hour for us. Without further ado, I'll kick it over to you, Yohan. All right, thanks so much, Derek, and thank you everyone for joining us and BNH for hosting this and inviting me. Um, so I'm Joran Schmid. I'm a veterinarian, I'm a wildlife photographer, and I own a safari company together with my partner, Amy, and we lead safaris throughout Africa. Um, and tonight I'm going to talk to you about a subject that a lot of people ask me and uh, I really get asked quite a bit is how can I make my shots look better? How can I make them stand out and pop more? Um, some people say I want to get shots like you. Well, you don't really want to get shots like me. You want to get your own shots, but you definitely want to get them to be more than the average. So I'm going to analyze and tell you some of uh, the things that I think are the keys to make that happen. Um, but before we're going to dive in, I want to go over something that most of you probably experienced. So this is the shot of the leopard that I was very proud of from one of my first safaris. Uh, it was a leopard that was looking at me. I was like very excited. It was, I remember it like, uh, like as if it was yesterday. But the question is, how do I make this shot and make it turn into a shot like this that I just took a couple of weeks ago in Kenya uh, on a safari that we were leading? What makes this shot look uh, different than the one that, again, meant a lot to me back then, but I mean, I've seen like thousands of uh, leopard shots like this. So what makes this one more special? Or a moment like uh, this, like playful lion cubs, um, is like some something really amazing to watch and a lot of fun. But how do you take a moment like that and make it into something that looks more like this? Um, so again, I'm going to give you some of my ideas and some of uh, some tips, and I'll tell you some stories behind the shots, and hopefully you'll get the way that I think, and, uh, and you'll be able to take some of these home with you. So um, you don't just walk into a scene and like get a shot like that. I mean, you may if you're very lucky, but chances are that if you are lucky, it's not going to happen often. So this is a shot that I took in southern Israel. It's a Nubian Ibex. And to get the shot like that, you have to get some preparation. You have to do a little bit of research, whether it's Google or asking friends, like, where can I find the Ibex? Where do they like to congregate? What do they like to eat? Where do they like to play? I have to check the weather on the day that I'm about to go. What time the sun rises? Uh, get my camera all ready. Uh, wake up at 2.30, drive three hours uh, into the darkness and find these Ibex and find a spot that I want to photograph. And only then, if everything is lined up and, um, and you get lucky and the Ibex does jump over the cliff, then you can get that shot. So it takes some preparation. And uh, that's something that's very important in order to make your shots uh, look good. You really have to work for them. Um, one of the more important things about uh, preparation is to know your subject. You can have, um, you have to, if there's something specific that you want to photograph, you have to know a lot about it. You have to know their life cycle and the times of year that they're uh, common and when do they have babies. For example, if you wanna see red fox kids in North America, um, it's something that you'll have to see during the spring, like April or May. Or if you wanna go and see the wildebeest migration, then in Kenya, you wanna see them crossing the river. Uh, you wanna go there and visit in, in August or September. If you're gonna visit in February, you're gonna see them, uh, they're gonna be in Tanzania giving birth. So you're not gonna see them. So you really have to know your subject. And that's a point that I can't emphasize enough, especially if there's one particular animal that you wanna photograph. Um, you also have to get the right gear for what you're uh, planning to photograph, especially if there's a certain shot that you have in mind. Um, to get this shot, for example, I had to get remote camera, uh, remote control. I had to lower my camera to the ground with a monopod. I had to use a very wide angle lens and other conditions that I had to meet in order, to, in order for it to happen. So getting your gear um, ready and make sure that you're fluent with your gear, that you know everything, all the buttons and everything is crucial in order to get, uh, to get you even ready for, for the shots. And the last thing in the preparation section 
is a guide. If you're going by yourself and it's totally fine, especially for local things, you have to do a very thorough research. Like sometimes I question people for days or I do a lot of Google research. And um, But if you're not going by yourself and you're relying on a good guide, uh, you have to get someone that's highly recommended. You have to make sure that the guide uh, knows the area, that he knows the animal, knows animal behavior, that he's He's great with photographers that he will know to place the, cam the, the car um, in a position that's great for photography. Um, you may even have to prepare your car in, in the car in a special setting like bean bags or take out the door, take out the window. So finding a good guide is a key to get great shots. So now we're gonna dive in and we're gonna talk about um, one by one about some of the key elements that will make your shots look better um, or make them pop more, should I say. First thing first is something that's pretty straightforward and that's portraits. Portraits are something that anyone can take, but not everyone, uh, every portrait will stand out. Some of them um, are just like a regular portrait and in order for it to stand out, you want to have something unique. For example, um, the facial expression on the animal, like this lioness that's growling on her cubs, that's what makes this shot, or this giraffe. Uh, in order to get the shot, we drove through a herd of giraffes and I noticed that this particular one keeps sticking his tongue. So when I focused on him and I waited for it, I was able to catch him like poking his nose with his tongue. And that's what makes this portrait. Or this laughing hyena. He's not really laughing, but when I saw him yawning once, if you know a little bit of about animal behavior, you know that he will most likely yawn again. And if you're ready with your camera focusing on him, then you'll be able to catch him in the middle of the yawn and it may look like he's laughing or growling and depending on the stage of the, of the yawn. Or this little bear cub, in order for you to, uh, if you know a little bit about bears, then you know that when they're nursing, as soon as they lift their head, you may see a little bit of a milk mustache around their mouth. Um, and if you wait more than one second, he's gonna lick his lips and the mustache is gone. So if you wanna get that, you have to, be, you have to know it and you have to be prepared. So that's what makes, again, special expressions is one thing that makes a portrait work. Another thing is eye contact. Eye contact is very, very important. It makes a shot very powerful. And if there's something special about the eyes, even more so. Like this one, this leopard cub has beautiful blue eyes and that's what makes, and the fact that she's looking straight at me, that's what makes this shot work. Or the curiosity in this red fox kits. Um, again, you have to get like special looks on uh, on the animals and or special features like this lion that's known as Scarface. Um, everyone knows that if he has something special about him, that's what will make it like the scar about his, his right eye or this cheetah with the damaged left eye that she has. That's what actually makes this portrait. Without it, it's just gonna be another portrait of a cheetah and it's not gonna be as special. So again, you have to have some special features in order for it to work. The opposite will be to zoom out and to show the animal in its environment. And that's something that, uh, especially if there's something special about the environment, then that will make the shot and will make it stand out. For example, a shot of an elephant walking through the field in the middle of the day, not so special, but when it walks towards sunset, when the clouds are there and the color of the sky turns orange and a little bit of sun shining on, his, on him, that's what makes the shot. Or this line, I've taken, thousands of shots of lions sitting down. But what makes this one a little more interesting is the way that he's sitting and the rock that he's sitting and the open spaces that he's looking at and the composition that makes him look towards that open space. These are all things that will that make the shot work. Or another example um, of zooming out a little bit, a rhino shot wouldn't be as special as if you as this one when you see Mount Kenya behind it. And in order to get this one, had to be lucky with Mount Kenya clear with no clouds. And we had to position the car in a way that we can see the rhino and the mountain behind it. So zooming out, very important, but it has to be something special about the environment in order for the shot to stand out. Another thing that everyone knows is light. That's probably the key element uh, for photography. Without it, we can't really take uh, photos. Um, the best time to photograph uh, wildlife is usually during what we call the golden hour, which is right around sunrise or just before sunset. Um, the colors are nice and beautiful and the light is soft and the animals are usually more active. So it's much more fun and um, than just looking at the sleepy leopard. Um, but sometimes if we want to get different kind of light, we have to work a little harder. If you want to get 
cheetahs hunting, sometimes you have to wait 12 hours in the heat uh, waiting for them to hunt. Or if you want to get a silhouette shot like this one, you have to wake up early in the morning in the dark, drive to a spot that um, with relatively clear background with not too many distractions. You have to be a little lower than your subject so you'll be able to shoot like at a lower angle. You have to get an animal um, that will have a distinctive feature like a giraffe or an elephant, a deer, something that people can actually tell what it is. <clears throat> and if there are more than if there's more than one animal, then you have to make sure that they're separated. So there's separation and it's clear what they are, that they're not like just like one big blurb. Um, to get um, these shots, you also have to find out what time the sun rises and make sure that the weather works. And a lot of things have to work and you have to be prepared also that um, there's a chance that you're gonna fail and you're gonna have, should have like a plan B, like a little tree that in case the giraffe doesn't show up, then you're gonna shoot the tree in, during sunrise, which is just as good. Um, same goes for sunset. Um, sunset may be a little easier just because you have the daylight and you can see better and you can prepare for it a little better. But again, all the conditions have to meet. Um, another example is the moon. Um, to photograph the moon, you have to, an animal with the moon, you have to know what time the moon rises, what time it sets, what's the condition of the moon, whether it's full moon or no moon. Uh, if the weather is gonna be nice and clear skies that you'll be able to see the moon, you have to know the direction that the moon rises. To get this shot, for example, I knew that there's gonna be a super moon during New Year's Day a few years back. And I, I wanted to photograph the owl, the snowy owl with the moon. So I drove to a place that the, snow, the, the owl was uh, spotted earlier that day. And when we arrived there, um, there was an owl. He was in a little valley and surrounded by quite a few people and the owl was sleepy. And I knew that there's no way that I'm gonna get it with the moon. So I took a little bit of a chance and I went on a walk on the beach and uh, in hope to find another owl, which the, slim, the chances were slim, but I still took that chance. Uh, and when I couldn't find anything, I started heading back. And that's when I spotted this guy. He was sitting on top of a little dune and I just quietly and slowly approached it from a safe distance and waited for the moon to rise. And I positioned myself so the moon's gonna rise right behind it. And that's what made this uh, shot. So a lot of preparation, a little bit of luck. Um, these are things that uh, work. A lot of us, especially beginners, know to shoot with the light behind you. So you're gonna get beautiful light on the subjects, but sometimes you have to dare and try things that are a little out of your comfort zone, like shooting against the, the light and getting backlit shots. If the animal has a little bit of uh, fur, then you can get this beautiful rim light, especially if you're underexposed uh, and with a black, a darker background. So playing with the light is very important. You can have the same situation from different angles and different photographers will produce different images and that's the beauty of it. But try not to be fixated and try to be open to new things that will definitely make your shots um, stand out. My favorite subject to photograph is interactions. If you follow me you on social media, you probably see a lot of that. Um, it's, it's something that I enjoy uh, when I see it in the field and I enjoy that uh, to see people's reactions when they see it in the field or look at my pictures. Um, in general, I tell people like if you see something that touches your heart that makes you smile or happy or sad or angry or it makes you some, feel something, then there's a good chance that if you're going to capture that shot and you're going to capture it well, your audience will uh, see the same thing. And then if they are able to feel something, you did your job and, and the picture is good. So interactions between mothers uh, to their babies are probably the most precious thing. Uh, it can be a lot of hugging and kissing and playing. And, um, and again, it's, it's something that you can't stay, like you can't ignore something like that. Like everyone falls in love with these kind of shots. Even if the interaction is like something minor, like this uh, zebra, just like, a little touch in the nose, but that's an interaction and that makes the shot. So if the, if you just shoot a single animal, not so interesting. When there's interaction, it makes it much more interesting. It can be even between siblings, like two male lions, like the, the bond between them, or like a brother and a sister with a little elephant like sitting on his sister that she's trying to nap. So these are the things that uh, make the shots more special. Interactions can also be between different species, like here, the cheetah and the hyena. So this cheetah made a kill and she barely took a bite of her kill and the hyena just walks into the scene and steals the kill from the cheetah. And obviously you feel sad and you're angry at the, at the hyena, 
Um, but that's nature. And I'm sure that my audience and my viewers uh, feel the same. But that's the real interaction that happened in the field. There are interactions that are not real and you have to create them. And what I'm talking about, I'm gonna explain right now. This giraffe and this bird that's called lilac breasted roller. I'm sure that they're in real life, they're not best friends and they're walking together wherever they go, they're going together. That's probably not the case. Uh, but the way that I positioned the car and the way that I framed the picture, it created this illusion of, uh, of some sort of interaction that makes it more interesting and more pleasing to the eye. So the interaction, interaction doesn't really have to be real. Um, you can create it, but that's what makes the picture a little more interesting. Or this shot of uh, Nubian Ibex in, again in Southern Israel, I call it Romeo and Juliet. And I'm sure that Romeo is not really talking to Juliet in this shot and he's not asking her like questions and asking her to come down. But there, that the fact that I framed them in the same frame and they're looking at each other, that creates this illusion that there is some sort of interaction between them and makes the viewer think and feel something. Um, it can even be an interaction between the animal and it's surrounding not with another animal. Like I was framing the, I framed the, this ibex with the moon and waited for it to lift his head. So as if he's looking at the moon. So you have to think around, see the things that you have that are available to you and see how you can do different framing to make the picture a little more interesting or this ibex smelling the flowers Again, I'm sure he wasn't, uh, not I'm sure, I know that he wasn't there like enjoying uh, like 10 minutes of like sniffing the flowers. He was just there for a split second, but that's all it, all it took to get the shot. A very important tip that I can give you in regards to interactions is to lift your head from the camera and look around. If you're surrounded with a herd of elephants or zebras or a pride of lions with lion cubs, try to see which is the one that's a little more active which is the naughty one, which is the troublemaker, which is the funny one. Um, in every group, there's that one. Um, and if you follow that one and just, and then you can go back into your camera and just follow that particular individual, there's a good chance that he's going to give you uh, a reward and there are going to be plenty of moments that will make you and your viewers very happy. Um, that's what happened with this uh, lion cub. Sometimes you have to, you, the other people in the car may follow other animals and you're going to hear them clicking and you think that you're missing something and you are taking a little bit of a chance by focusing on one particular animal. But if you really isolated the right one, I promise you, you're going to get beautiful shots and, and very special ones that your, your friends are going to be jealous of. So again, try to look who's the troublemaker and just follow this one and that's, that's going to be good. Um, another thing that can make your shots look uh, more special or make them stand out more is shooting from different angles. This shot was taken with a remote control camera that was placed on the ground. And you don't just drive in front of a herd of elephants, put the camera on the ground, back, back away and hope that the elephants will walk to the camera and smile and uh, everything will be good. The elephants will probably run away. To get this shot, I had to see, we saw the elephants far away. They were like 20 minutes away from, from us we try to think together with the guide and that's where a good guide is comes in um, important try to think where are they heading are they heading towards certain trees or bushes or in this case they were heading towards a water hole now you have to try and think where are they gonna uh, cross the the road and where's a good place to place the camera and then you have to do it in a place that's a allowed b it's safe for you to get out of the car and do it and see that it doesn't bother the animals, that you're doing it way in advance so the animals are not disturbed. And then you put the camera on the ground, you frame the picture as you want, you get all your settings, um, and I'll be happy to talk about settings for something like that later on at the Q&A if you have any questions. But you have to do a lot of exposure compensation, for example, here, and I use manual focus. And then you just put the camera on the ground and, um, and you let the animals come. And you have to be prepared for a failure either that the animals are not going to come to your, um, to your camera or that the elephant's going to step on your camera or if it's lying, you may grab your camera and just walk away with it or bite it and break it. And I mean, I've seen, thank God, never happened to me yet, but I know it's a risk that, um, that I have to take. Another way to get low angle shots is to lie down on the ground, um, whether you're walking um, and you're seeing foxes in your neighborhood or you're on safari and it's safe and it's allowed and it doesn't bother the animals, then 
ask the guide, um, get out of the car, lie very close to the car so the animals are not going to see you, not going to notice you, you're going to be part of the car, and then, uh, and then just photograph and it makes the pictures a lot more impre impressive, it gives a different uh, perspective of your subject, and um, it, it's much better than like shooting from like, um, like the roof of the, car, of the car, for example. So different angles is, is very, very important. Um, different kind of angle is like positioning. So it's not up and down, like down, you can again, remote or like lie down on the ground, up you can shoot from a helicopter or from a drone, but you can also have to control your positioning. Um, don't leave things to coincidence because um, you're probably gonna fail. Here I was trying to photograph this elk in Pennsylvania and there are a lot of uh, trees and it was hard to get a clear shot. So I drove down the road and I saw this clearing and I just waited for the elk to come into the clearing and that's how I managed to get this shot. Or this lion, for example, I had to ask the guide to drive back a little bit to place the lion and the sun in a way that was pleasing to me. Um, and, and that's how I got this shot. If I left it to coincidence, the sun was actually shining from the lion's butt. So it would look like as if he's pooping the sun and that wouldn't be a good shot, I think. Uh, maybe for like comedy awards. Um, another thing that you should do is play with your camera. Your camera has so many buttons, use them. Um, the basic ones, I'm just gonna go over a few uh, shutter speed. I love shooting animals in motion with slower shutter speed. The favorite thing is uh, panning shots. To get a panning shot, uh, you have to use a relatively slow shutter speed. In this case, uh, this zebra it was 1 25th of a second. And you take the shot and you move the camera with your subject and you take a sequence of uh, shots. Um, and chances are that a lot of them will be garbage, that they're not going to be useful. But if you get one reasonably, reasonably sharp um, and 20 garbage, you did a very good job. So panning shots is one thing. Another thing, if you want to convey motion, you can just use lower the uh, shutter speed and let the animal's movement um, create something more artistic. Or you can use special effects. Um, this is not my style, but I took this shot on this on my recent safari just so I can show it for this presentation. If you use a slower shutter speed while you're zooming in and out on your subject, um, then you can get this effect. So slow shutter speed is one way. Obviously, the opposite, faster shutter speed, you can freeze the action for birds in flight or for water droplets. And so it depends on what you're trying to show. You should choose, but you should, but you should definitely use the slow and fast to and play with them. Um, if you will join me on Safari, you will, uh, and some people are probably laughing in the crowd, um, you know that I love shooting animals in the rain. Um, and I'm going to show you what the shutter speed does, how it changes the image and how it changes the mood of the image. So the same baboon and her baby, uh, same really pouring rain. Um, this was taken at one thousandth of a second. This one was taken at uh, four hundredths of a second. And this one was taken at eightieth of a second. So you see that the rain looks a, little, a lot more smudged here. Um, personally, my personal favorite is the middle one. Um, I should have slowed the shutter maybe even a touch more, like 300 of a second or so. But this is the effect that I, that I, that conveyed the mood of like the mother protecting her baby and it's clear that it's rain. Um, so again, don't be afraid to play with your, with your settings, especially if, it, if it's a scene that uh, stays stationary for a while. Another thing to play with is your aperture. Um, this was shot with a very wide aperture, um, F4. And what it does, it separates your subject from, from the background. So your subject pops a little more and it, it looks a little more pleasing to the eye. So um, whatever your cam your lens, uh, the lens that you have, try to use your widest aperture and see what it does. Um, the opposite will be to use a narrow aperture like this was with F14. Uh, and that I use that because I wanted to show the lion's environment and the trees and everything to be in, a real, in the same depth of field. So it's gonna be relatively in focus. So don't be afraid to play with your, with your aperture. Another thing that you should play with is your exposure compensation. Um, that's something that not a lot of people uh, play with. Um, to get a high key shot like this zebra, you have to have a relatively bright background behind it and you overexpose 
In this case, I overexposed exposed by uh, stopping two thirds um, to get this effect. And the opposite, to get more a moody shot um, with a darker background and shooting against the light, I underexposed by two thirds and then you get a low key shot. So again, don't be afraid to play with your camera to get to reach different effects. Another topic, and I know I'm running, but you'll have plenty of time to, I hope, to ask questions at the end. So I'll be happy to go over things that are not clear later on. Another thing is composition. Composition can make or break your photos. And uh, even if you got great shot, if you didn't compose it right, it can really ruin the picture. There are a lot of rules that you can follow and you don't have to follow all of them and it's okay to break some of the rules. But the tendency of a lot of people is when they see something, especially for the first time, is just to zoom on that subject and to place it dead center. And it's not something that's usually pleasing to the eye. So the one rule that a lot of people like to follow is the rule of thirds, where you divide the screen into thirds and the intersection in, of the thirds is where you usually want to place your subject. And if the subject is walking to the right, then leave some more space on the right side of the image. Or even if he's just looking there and he's stationary, leaving him some room to the place that he's looking at, uh, and not just like the end of the picture, that will make it more pleasing to the eye. Or this zebra that was just standing there and looking to the right of the image, so I, I position him this way. And if you look at the red dots where the intersections of the rule of thirds, so I didn't really follow it exactly. It's not a rocket science that you have to go exactly by the millimeter. Here I wanted to include the tree in the background, so that's why I positioned the the zebra a little lower. So rule of thirds is one thing that you should follow. Another thing that will help you compose is leading lines. You have to know what's the key element of your picture and try to get everything to point to that key element. So the viewer's eye will go straight to that element. In this case, I wanted everyone to see the giraffe kissing her baby that's about to be born. And you can see all these leading lines that are actually leading the viewer to the to the eye, to the to the, the giraffe's uh, mouth and to the baby, her legs, her the way that her neck is pointing, even that little line in the horizon, they're all pointing to the same direction, and that's what makes the shot. Or in this line that's looking dead at me, um, the leading lines in this case are the rock that's like a little slanted and the lion's paws. So using leading lines in composition, very very important. This shot, for example, I'm showing an example of how you don't have to follow the rules and you can, if something looks pleasing to you, you can actually go against the rules. And here I'm going against two rules. One is the rule of thirds where I put the elephant dead center. But if you can see, I left more room above him. And that's something that usually looks more pleasing to the eye, especially here with the grass, the golden grass at the bottom and the darker background. And the other rule that I'm breaking here is that you, in wildlife, you often want your subject to look at you. Uh, and to have some sort of an eye contact. But I think in this case, the butt contact actually works uh, works a little better. I think that if the elephant actually looked at me, it wouldn't be as special. So again, it's okay to go against the rules. You should know the rules and know when to imply and when, when not to. Another key element that I love to use for composition is to use natural frames. Um, you have to choose again, decide what's your main subject. In this case, it's uh, a leopard cub that I shot a couple of weeks ago in our safari. And what's framing him here is the mother's body with the curve of the body plus the extension of the tail that's a little curved. They're all like kind of circling around the cub and that's the way that I found to compose the, the shot. Or this uh, baby elephant that's framed by other elephant's legs. Legs in general are good uh, frames. Um, this lioness framing her cub with her paws, um, or this uh, giraffe framing this oxpecker, this naughty oxpecker. Um, so again, using the legs is, a, is an easy one. Another thing that you should look for is different shapes and patterns that you can use to as your background or as part of your composition. Here I saw this ox pecker on top of a zebra and I waited for another zebra to walk behind so I can get the zebra in the background. So again, keep you always have to keep looking. I did the same thing here with this shot. I waited for another zebra to walk behind this one and it causes this illusion of like one zebra with like two bodies. Um, took a lot of trials until, until I was lucky to get this shot. But again, if you think about it and you plan it and you envision it, eventually you may get it. 
very, very important that your uh, picture will tell a story. You want your viewers to feel something. You want to evoke emotions. Uh, you want them to sympathize or empathize with, you, with the subject. Um, like here, everyone feels for the mother and for the baby that uh, she's protecting from the pouring rain, or anyone can feel the love um, that this lioness has to her cub that she's hugging him. So try to tell a story and the story can have different uh, elements it can be just like an animal deep in thoughts or if something that made you laugh and you want the viewer to laugh then you can show that that can be a story the story can also be just a sense of a place like just to show people like the serengeti and how big the rocks are there that the lions look so small on them or it can be a sense of movement like that if there's a lot of action you want to convey that story Another part of a story that you can tell is the, the local weather. Um, for example, when I posted this shot, a lot of people were surprised. They said, you didn't know that it's so cold in, in Africa and Africa can be cold. So if you join us on safari, bundle up, uh, especially for the mornings. Um, so telling um, the weather is, I think it's, it's a very interesting story that a lot of people can relate to. Like this poor lioness that you can see how miserable she is like in walking in the pouring rain. Um, she was walking, joining the other lions under the tree until the rain stopped. Um, or this elephant that I shot a couple of weeks ago in, uh, in Kenya, like a single elephant facing the storm that's about to come. So telling a story about the weather, I think it uh, can be very, very powerful. Another thing that, and that's probably something that you can't teach, but you have to keep it at the back of your head you always have to um, zoom out a little bit and look around and see what's available. Try to plan your shots and not leave things for coincidence. And you have to take some risks. For example, here we followed the family of cheetahs and they were pretty much sleepy. They didn't really do much. So we decided to leave them and we saw a herd of wildebeest and they were just approaching the river and they were debating whether they should cross. and. That's what wildebeest do. They can sometimes debate for like days until they decide to cross. And I saw that some, nothing's gonna happen with them either when it started to drizzle a little bit. And then I noticed this beautiful rainbow in the, uh, in the sky. So immediately I told the guide, I wanna go back to the cheetahs. Um, and even though it was like a 20 minute drive back to the cheetahs and it was a risk that the rainbow may disappear I decided to take that risk and we came to the cheetahs. We found them, they were actually a little more active. So they just woke up and all we had to do was just position the car in a way that we can see the cheetahs and the rainbow in something that looks pleasing to you and you get the shot. So again, I had to keep them, the cheetahs in the back of my head and envision this shot that I wanted to get of them and take a risk because I, I could have gotten to the cheetahs and the rainbow would have been gone, but that's part of the, part of the deal. Or I told you at the beginning, you should know your subject. So if you know a little bit about animals or certain animals, then you can predict or anticipate certain shots. And this way your reaction time will be shorter. For example, if you know cheetahs and uh, you know that after they've been sitting down for a while, when they get up, they're gonna most likely stretch. So if you're prepared with your, if you see them that they're getting up, zoom out a little bit with your camera to give them some space and get ready for that stretch and, and most likely you're gonna get that. Or if you see uh, a big cat coming towards water, you should uh, know that one of the two things, most likely one of the two things will happen, either that they're gonna jump or they're gonna come to drink from the water. So if they're gonna jump, you wanna decide where you wanna position yourself. Do you wanna get a headshot of the lioness or you wanna see her jumping from the side? You have to get your shutter speed fast enough so you can get the picture sharp. Um, so you have to keep uh, thinking about what's gonna happen and plan in advance or these cheetahs that we saw a couple of weeks ago, um, when they were heading towards the water, we knew that they're gonna drink. And so you have to position the car to get the reflection. You have to decide like here, I had to shoot from the top of the vehicle, for example, because if I shot from below, the grass would be on the way and I wouldn't get the full reflection. So you have to keep thinking and uh, again, creating certain shots if I was just following them from behind where we were earlier, the shot wouldn't be interesting. It was just like cheetahs from behind drinking water or um, this cheetah shaking um, after the rain. If you know animals that, and you know animals that have hair, um, short or long hair, 
after the rain or during the rain, there's a good chance that they're gonna shake their head. So get ready, depending on what you wanna create, whether a very fast shutter speed to freeze the moment or a little slower to show the, the drops uh, smudge a little more and position the car in a way that's gonna be pleasing to you, whether it's right in front of the animal or to the side. Um, again, knowledge of animal behavior is pretty much necessary for these things. Um, birds, speaking of birds, um, you know, if you see a bird on a perch and you see that the bird is pooping, that's a little sign for you that the bird is about to take off. So get ready to and leave the bird some space for where it's about to take off and or change your settings, like your shutter speed a little faster so you'll be able to catch it. Or um, certain birds like bee eaters or kingfishers, if you see them sitting on a branch or on a little perch um, and all of a sudden they took off, chances are that they took off to hunt something and they'll be right back. So if you're gonna stay focused on that little branch that they were on and look outside of the camera, so don't stay focused in, but look outside and try to see when they're coming back. As soon as you see that they're coming back, start clicking and you're gonna get them like in the landing position. So again, knowing animal behavior and anticipating certain shots, these are the things that make um, make the shots, um, your shots stand out than just like a regular bird standing on the, on the branch. Uh, last thing, and that's something that I'm not gonna get into this uh, in today's presentation, but it's something that I go over with my guests on Safari and I'll maybe give presentation about it in the future is editing. Editing can also make your shots uh, stand out more. I put an example of a little extreme shot, uh, extreme edit. Um, so you can see the before on the left and the after on the right side. But it's not just that the editing will uh, make your shots look better, but one of the key elements that I tell people on Safari is, is that a lot of people like try to clear their memory during safaris and while we're uh, they're looking in the back of the camera and they're deleting pictures. I usually recommend not to delete anything while you're not in the on your computer because some of the shots that may not look good to you on on the back of the camera, they can be saved after in some editing. Um, again, it's much better if you do all your uh, exposures and everything right in first place in the field, but sometimes we, we're, we're only human, so sometimes we don't do everything perfect, and that's when the editing can come up uh, handy. So to summarize the things that we talked about, um, what are some of the key features that can make a picture as a wildlife image a special one? Something that I didn't mention, if you capture a rare sighting or something that hasn't been documented before, then that will make the picture special, even if, if you didn't do it like technically perfect, like here, we were among the first ones to see and document uh, a cheetah that gave birth to seven uh, cubs in the wild. Um, so rare sighting is one thing. As we discussed different point of views, whether you leave a camera on the ground or you're shooting from a helicopter, that can make the picture more interesting and stand out. If your picture evokes emotion and the viewer feels something after they see it or they, they empathize with it, then that's, that, that, that means that the picture is good. Or if the picture tells a story, and again, it doesn't have to be the exact story that like here, it looks like they're all like looking something and that little cub makes it look like as if they saw an alien landing uh, in Kenya, but, um, and all they saw was just like uh, someone that just distracted them like in another car. But that's telling a story is a big thing. And as, as we discussed also playing with the light and trying different angles and different uh, exposures can make your shots and the same thing goes for uh, different techniques, slow shutter, fast shutter, bigger aperture, smaller aperture, exposure compensation, and so on. So that's the end. Um, and now we're going to take some questions if there are any. Um, I just, before the questions, I just want to um, remind everyone that um, hey, it's a uh, if you, if you want, you can follow me on uh, Facebook and Instagram. You can uh, check out our safaris on our website. I'll show the slide after the questions. Um, and again, if there are more questions that you have after this presentation and that you remember to ask when, it, when we finish, then you can also shoot me an email and I'll put the slide next. So back to you, Derek. Yes, enough. You could just remind us uh, your website and Instagram so we can get that out there. 
Boom. There we go. So there's all the information for you guys looking for it. If you want to take a screen grab of that or jot it down real quick. I love that ending slide. That was the, I don't think I've <laughs> ever seen a better, <laughs> better uh, end slide there. Now, we're obviously going to start the place we love to start. Our viewers <laughs> love to know about the gear. Um, so Norman, who, uh, Norman, who's joining us from uh, Facebook, was asking in particular about the silhouette shot from the beginning. Um, what camera, what lenses do you use? What is in your everyday kit? And then is there a favorite go-to lens that you have? Okay, so I don't have the newest and fanciest gear and some of the shots that I took that actually won some awards were taken with a basic camera with the kit lens. Um, so I know photographers keep saying it's not about the gear. It is about the gear, but it's not the most important thing. Uh, it's very important and it makes things a lot easier. I use uh, Nikon, I use uh, mostly Nikon D5 and D850, and I'm sacrificing my D750 for the remote control uh, shots, um, for the elephants kicking them or lions grabbing them. Um, lenses that I use, I use the Nikon, the older version of the 200 to 400, um, and the F4 lens. And I use, I also have the 70 to 200, the 24 to 70, the 2.8 and for the wide angle shots, I use the 14 to 24 millimeter lens, the Nikon one. Um, so the, my on Safari, um, my go-to lens, my go-to kit is the D5, just because it's good with low light and it's very fast. Um, with the 200 to 400, I do shoot a lot of um, um, uh, animals in their environment. And for that, I use the 70 to 200 or 24 to 70. Um, but that's, these are the main things. And for the silhouette that he was asking, it was shot with the D5 uh, with the 70 to 200 lens. Um, I don't remember the exact setting, but that, that was the, the gear that I used. Okay. It, I, I love how you said that. It's, it's not the gear, but it is the gear. And it's like it's anybody who is a photographer and especially professional photographers, know exactly what you mean where it's like <laughs> yes the gear matters but at the same time it doesn't really matter it's the, really the person behind the gear but at a certain point yes the gear does make it a, a heck of a lot easier to accomplish it a lot sure of the does. shots you want to get yeah, yeah. Uh, have you considered the um the mirrorless going mirrorless to like the z6 and the z7 i know the z6 and the z7 are beginning raved about by every photographer i've seen that has used them have you considered going mirrorless at all yes i'm actually just in the debate of like switching um and a lot of thoughts thoughts that go through my head so uh, if Nikon sees this and they want to like sponsor me, I'll be more than happy to try <laughs> everything that they want. Um, but yeah, it's definitely something that I'm considering. Um, if you travel internationally using gear that's lighter is uh, makes things a lot easier, less arguments uh, with, uh, with the employers at the gate and, and, uh, and on the flight. And also it's easier on your back as you get older, it's much easier to hold. And some of the specs of these cameras are like, are amazing. And some of the newest technology, like different focusing and like uh, tracking, it's, it's really amazing. So definitely, I think that that's the future. Um, so before I'm gonna invest in more lens, uh, I will most likely switch to mirrorless, yes. Definitely, now, now we're sticking with the gear theme. I told you gear is popular. And when you were talking yeah. about the lenses and cameras, um, we had some questions come in particularly about your safari gear. So outside of the camera gear, what is a, a typical pack um, considered for you for, your, for going out on safari? Is there any other items or accessories that you live or die by when you're out on the safari? Okay, so first of all, if most of the safari outfitters that you go with, I hope it, and that most of them, I know that we do that, we give you a, a list of, um, of uh, like packing list and things that you should bring with you. Um, it's something that, that's, I mean, it's very important because not everyone knows what to expect. Um, I think that for photography, um, you have to have some cleaning kit with you. Um, there's a lot of dust going on. You should make sure that if they don't provide you with, um, with bean bags, then, then at least um, bring bean bag with you and then fill it during the, 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 during the trip. Um, so that's very important. Um, I'm trying to think about like 
plenty of plenty of batteries, plenty of uh, plenty of uh, memory cards. Um, I like to bring like a power strip, for example, like to charge your gear. Sometimes all you have is just one little outlet. So if you have a power strip, that's something that can um, that can that's important. These are the things that I think about it. About um, binoculars is also very very important. It's something that you should. Um, I mean, some of the companies will provide you with binoculars, but it's always been good to bring your own so you don't have to share with other people. Um, this way you can, some of the things happen far, most of them happen close, but it's, it's binoculars is very important. Interesting. I don't think out of all the wildlife uh, webinars we've had, I've ever heard binoculars. It's something that you don't even think about. And, and I'm guessing you have enough experience with this. So I'm sure you see all this, all the, faces when people are like oh wait i didn't bring that and i never thought to bring it so yeah and, and also i'm i'm i with all modesty i love to spot animals and i'm pretty good at it so I, and and sometimes when you spot things even without binoculars and they're very far and people are having a hard time like finding it so if you have a binoculars then uh, again most of the time on safari especially in east africa you see things pretty close to your car but sometimes it's far and binoculars can be very uh very handy well, as we're talking about stuff being far away, Lucia, who's joining us here on Zoom, is asking if you ever use uh, extenders on your telephoto lenses, do you notice a difference in image quality? Yes. If you do? Yes. So I, I do use, um, rarely I would say, and if you can have, uh, like I know most companies, uh, most brands have built-in teleconverters. It's, it's in some of the lenses a lot more expensive, but it's really good, especially since you don't want to like change lenses and add the extend add the extender while you're like um, in the dust and everything. But I do use it for certain sightings that you don't have access to or you don't want to disturb the animal. Uh, I mostly use the 1.4, the Nikon 1.4, and I think it's, it works pretty good with the focusing. Um, obviously the image quality is a little, it's not as good, but it's, it's still good enough. Um, the, Times two, I rarely, I have it, but I rarely use it. Um, but yeah, so I, I do use them. Okay, and we had a question from David joining us here on Zoom, asking if you've ever used drones as part of your workflow. So I don't use drones, uh, mostly because it's not allowed in, uh, in East Africa. Um, I mean, you can have special permits and special reserves, but most of the places that we go are Kenya and Tanzania and it's not allowed. And, um, they give permits like very rarely. So that's, that's the main reason why. Okay. Now in kind of keeping in that same thing with what's allowed, what's not, to, what's not allowed. Um, we had Brian Spector who's joining us on Facebook. Hey, Brian, um, asking about if you're commissioned by a safari to take images, who owns the rights to the pictures at the end? If you wanted to submit these images for competitions or selling them and using them for stock or commercial use, um, how does it normally break down? Do you have any experience with that end of things? Yeah, I do. I do. I mean, you're the photographer, you own the images. Um, obviously, it all depends on the contract that you sign. And some of the companies will try to um, get you to waive all your rights to the image. But the bottom line is that you're the owner of the image and you're the one that's, uh, again, the later on about percentage and things like that. It's something that you have to uh, decide with with whoever it is that you're working, but still, you're allowed to submit the images to a competition. And and if I work with someone, I make sure that I'm I own the pictures um, when we go over the contract, and that they that I can submit and uh, the images to competitions and, and so on. Okay, yeah, and that's one of those things where it's uh, it's very situational, where it can go either way, and it's always best to get various opinions because there's never one answer that's right, right especially when you're talking contracts and situations absolutely um you know it's, it's every you're gonna have half the people you ask telling you no 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 don't accept anything less than this and then the other right. half is going to be saying who cares just take whatever and then it's a good connection so you got to figure out sometimes your your own way it's trial and error sometimes you get you get burned yeah. and you learn from the experience um what about Tripods and monopods, Barry, who's joining us on live stream is asking, do you use tripods out in the field or monopods? So I use it quite often, but not in Africa. Um, like this morning, I went looking for snowy owls in New York. I brought the, the tripod with me. Um, in in uh, Africa, usually use bean bags. 
uh, bean bags are very handy to stabilize your image. Um, and and you, there's just not enough room for people in the car with tripods and with, uh, you know, it hits people and, and so on. So in Africa, if you want to use tripod, it's usually outside of the car when you want to get like night photography and, and, and things like that. Otherwise, I usually use it for when, when I'm not in Africa. Monopod is something that I use um, mostly for my, um, when I want to get like low angle shots. So I lower my camera with an upside down monopod and that's how I get some of the low shots. So if I can't go down uh, on the ground myself, like to lie down on the ground, then I lower my camera and with the remote and that's how I get some of the low angle shots. Again, if everything is, if it's allowed and if it doesn't disturb the animals, obviously. Is there, along with like a packing list, when you, on your safaris, and we had a couple questions on your safaris as far as how often you do them, but I also wanted to know, is that something that um, you recommend people research on their own, or do you provide people that go on your safaris a list of, this is not allowed, or, you know, because every country has their own laws, and then, like you said, with the tripods, I never would have thought about that being in a confined space and not right. using tripods. Is it something where you recommend or, or inform people of the laws or, or is that the onus of the traveler to know the laws and what's allowed and what's not allowed? So, I mean, some, some companies, um, well, I, I know a lot of companies, especially companies that, um, you know, they don't, I would say bigger companies may not get into the details and they just have like their general packing list and, but smaller companies like boutique companies like ours, we usually, um, it's, very much hands-on. We, we tell you exactly what to bring with you. We talk to you. We explain to you what a day looks like. Um, it's again, to the level of like, literally like what, what to wear in every day. And so um, definitely something we, we go over people and people always um, ask us questions throughout the process from months in advance when they start get, getting ready for the, for the trip until like, the day of we keep getting a lot of questions and and we always answer like again everything we usually you can't really cover everything because people will always come up with like new new questions but we mention a lot of things based on people's experience on 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 our safaris um we always learn new things ourselves like we always come up like with like we had people on a wheelchair and how to deal with it. And, it and it's definitely possible. And we're very flexible and we're accommodating everyone. So if you wanna bring your tripod, um, you can bring your tripod and sometimes you can set up, we can do a setup on, on certain cars that you can have like a gimbal head sitting on, uh, on the side of the car. And I mean, there are a lot of things that we can, or not just us, like companies can accommodate. Um, it depends on what people will ask the question and. and Always, always will find a solution and will tell you what's allowed and what's not. Well, I think the best sales point for your uh, sales pitch for your safaris is just looking at the images. I mean, me and the rest of the event space team, we're messaging each other over here during your presentation. Like, oh my God, <laughs> these images are amazing. Um, so I think you look at stuff like that and it's, it's funny, the recurring theme is preparation and it has nothing to do, like you said earlier about the gear. I mean, that's a small portion of it, but just simple things that recognizing animals behavior and the more you know about the animals and their habits and their them, how they act in their natural habitat is what opens you up for a lot of these shots, right? Absolutely. And, and again, the fact that we're using, I mean, we have like over a hundred safaris uh, in East Africa. And so we've dealt with a lot of guides and we narrowed it down to the best guides in the business. And you really see a difference between a guide that I used like 10 years ago and the guides that I'm using today. I know now what to look in a guide and what, who, are good, who is a good one and who is not. And, um, and, and definitely it's, it's something that's, that's very, very important, um, the guide. And in our case, when you join our safaris, whether you're an uh, amateur photographer or professional, um, a little added ben uh, benefit that you have is that I'm a veterinarian, so I do understand a little more about animal behavior. So often I will tell people, oh, get ready, the cheetah is about to do this, or the bird is about to do that. And, and this way you can be ready, especially when there are like a lot of like dull moments and you're sitting and you're waiting for an animal to do something. If someone tells you to get ready, then, I mean, it's sometimes it's a split second and you can miss the shot. So 
some of the shots that you see here is just because I know a little bit about animal behavior and, um, and can prepare for, the, for a certain moment and anticipate it. I mean, that's a huge bonus right there, especially when you're talking about going on safaris. It is, it's an investment. I mean, a lot, for a lot of people, they save up their money to go on these once in a lifetime trips. And it's kind of like taking a trip to Iceland. You want to see the Northern Lights. If you go to Iceland, and you don't see the Northern Lights, you're going to go home and you're never going to be happy. So yeah. you, you want to be in good hands when you go. Now, we're going to jump back to gear because our people love gear, as I okay. said. Um, we had a lot of questions on the... Um, remote trigger that you're user, using mm -hmm. for the Nikon. So which, which uh, shutter release are you using? And also okay. filters, if you use any filters at all, like neutral density, polarizing, anything like that. So I, I don't use any filters at all. Um, regarding the remote, what I usually use uh, for, I mean, there are two kinds of remote control that I use. One is that I leave the camera on the ground and uh, walk away. That's the kind that usually um, tends to fail a little more, again, mostly because you're, there's a lot of gambling where the animal's gonna pass and if they're gonna be close enough. Um, in order for the shots to be more impressive, you want to have, um, I mean, a relatively wide field. So I usually like, use uh, 14 millimeters at F14. So the animal has to be really close uh, and relatively big animal in order for it to be an effective shot. And again, you're taking a risk that something's gonna to happen to the camera. But for that uh, thing, I usually um, get the settings um, all planned in advance. I usually do manual focus for these things. Um, I use a little table that you can download online of hyperfocal point. It's a, mm. it's a point that uh, if you set your focus to that point, then anything uh, half the distance before that and to infinity will be in focus. So this way, it's almost certain that if the animal is going to walk, unless the animal really touches its nose in the camera, which makes other kind of cute pictures, um, then the, the picture will be in, in focus. And so that's why I use manual focusing. Um, the other kind of remote that I use um, is when I, as I said, I lowered the camera to the ground with the monopod. And if you have a camera that the, the back screen can uh, pop out, then you can turn it in 90 degrees and then when you can actually look through the screen or if your camera has wi-fi and you have like an application on your phone sometimes sometimes there's a little bit of uh, delay but you can see in your phone you can see what your camera sees and and then you can press either the remote or you can press it on your on your phone so these are the kind of remotes that i use again either that i actually hold the camera but just lower it to the ground because i physically can't go there because there's a lion or that I leave the camera on the ground and, and hope for the best. And that requires, again, a lot of planning and a lot of knowledge, um, mostly from the guide. Interesting. As, as far as editing, we had a question on what you use to edit and if there's any resources you recommend looking into for people who are looking to brush up on their editing skills. Uh, yes, so I use mostly Lightroom for my editing and, um, and then I do some touch-ups on in Photoshop, um, especially if I submit to competitions or like certain pictures that I'm sending for print, then um, that's what I use. Another uh, program that I like to use a lot is uh, Topaz um, Denoise. Um, it's really a great program for um, to denoise. Um, they have other programs like Sharpman, but the Denoise is my favorite one. But again, I would say 90 something percent of my work is in Lightroom. And then the rest is uh, Photoshop and, and plugins like Topaz. Okay. And for those looking for great Photoshop resource, uh, we have Jesus Ramirez from the Photoshop training channel on here fairly regularly. That is an amazing resource for those who are looking for instructional videos. We do have some in the event space, so you can catch this presentation and all of our other webinars uh, on our live stream page, which is livestream.com backslash BH event space and on the BH event space Facebook page. If you go on Facebook and just type in BH event space, go to the video section, you can find it there. Now, I know a lot of you did have questions on um, the safaris that Yaron is running. So if you could just tell us what you have set up for 2021, are you guys, have you guys seen any um, cancellations or how many are you looking to do this year? And uh, everybody has the information there. So I would encourage those of you who had questions. Um, we had a lot of questions about price and scheduling and all of that. 
Um, so I would definitely have you guys reach out and, and ask your own um, in email or through the website um, these questions so you can get more detailed information on this. But you don't tell us what you guys have uh, coming up in 2021. So um, we just got back from a trip in Kenya to Kenya because we wanted to see what it's like to travel during these crazy times uh, before we sent pe uh, people um, on safari. And uh, it was actually surprisingly, it felt surprisingly safe to, to travel. I did uh, post a very long post about it on, on my page, on my Facebook and in Instagram, and a detailed post about like what it's like exactly to travel. So once we clear that part and we know uh, what it's like and what to expect and, and what are the safety uh, precautions that you have to take, we do have a few trips planned um, and we opened new ones now just after we felt that it's safer to Tanzania. Uh, into Kenya in March and in, uh, in in February and March, and we have a few trips to Kenya scheduled for July, August, September, October, November. We also do private safaris, um, not just group safaris. So we also, if someone is interested to go by himself or with just with a friend or with family, then we can build the trip according to whatever they want. We, our goal, my business partner Amy, she makes dreams come true. Um, so if you have a certain thing that you dreamed on having, um, she will make it happen. So it's, it's something that you should, um, again, we, we will custom and, and build a safari according to your biggest wishes. If you want to see leopards, we're going to build an itinerary just based on where your best chance is to see leopards. And I promise you, you're going to get shots of leopards just like, like I got. And if you, so we, we do have private safaris um, that we can, the dates can be flexible and we have group safaris that you can just inquire and we'll give you the details. Basically we work with photographers and with non-photographers and we can work with almost any budget. Um, there is obviously a minimum budget that you should have, but the budget can influence the number of days that you're gonna stay, the level of accommodations, um, the guides that we're gonna use, the how many people are gonna be in your car. So if you find cheaper safaris, it doesn't mean that it's like, I mean, it usually means that there's some sort of compromise. And again, we're going to explain everything to you and we're pretty open about it because we think that since, as you said, it's like people invest for that and some people go just once to Africa, even though we secretly tell people that you don't go to Africa just once because once you go there, you always want to come back, but don't tell anyone. Um, <laughs> the, but if this is your dream and this is your one trip, then we, we're here to help you and make it happen. So um, it, it's, I mean, we'll, we'll be here to help. Yeah, I mean, every, every single wildlife photographer, whether it's a hobbyist, amateur, professional, all alike, they always say, it's always like, you know what? I went into debt on three credit cards. I took out another mortgage on my house, but I would do it all over again. They never regret it. it and you know, if you want to yeah. see the difference, just come come on a trip with me up here to the Bronx Zoo, and, and <laughs> you're, you're going to see how much it doesn't cut it, because now after looking at your photos for an hour, I'm like, ah, oh, I got to go. One of these days, one of these days, I'll drag myself out of New York and go on a safari, but you know, Let's do it. amazing, amazing <laughs> images, a ton of great, useful Im information in an easy to digest format. So we thank you again for, for joining us. Again, for those of you who have any uh, questions, feel free to reach out. And I do encourage you to check out the Instagram page, the Facebook page, support, follow, and uh, hopefully Yoram will get to see some of you guys on a future safari. But I want to thank you again. A huge thank you to all of our viewers for sticking with us on another rendition of the DNH <laughs> Virtual Event Space. We will catch you all next time.